Welcome to part two of True Health Tuesdays, Elbow Realignment. Now, it's really important, like uber important, okay, that anyone that attempts to do an adjustment like this, they do it under the supervision and of an experienced uh, chiropractor who can uh, understand the line of drive, which is hugely important, and how to assess it. We're going to go through how to assess and correct it, but these adjustments have to be done by a qualified, qualified professional. Um, now, number one, before you do any work on the elbow, you've got to make sure that the cervical alignment that for head carriage is being addressed. You have to adjust all the attachments of that upper extremity all the way down before you get to the elbow. So you're talking the sternoclavicular joint, you're talking the acromion cl clavicular joint, the glenohumeral joint, everything. You've got to realign it. And then once you get all of that, then you can assess and correct the elbow. Now, number one for cervical adjusting and alignment. Now you'll see there's almost no rotation, but the head is in slight extension. And you're going to see it's a very, very simple. I'm using no more than two to four pounds of pressure, and I'm using only my index finger. And I'm utilizing x-rays to guide whether I'm going to be applying pressure on the articulating pillars of the cervical spine or the spinous process, which is going to radically alter the line of drive. And then um, cervical decompression. Now, since most degeneration in the cervical spine occurs at C5, C6, you have to go down to about T1, maybe even T2, depending on the thickness of the person. The thicker the person, the more flesh you've got to remove out to soft tissue traction that out. And then you contact C5, the head's in slight extension, and you maintain pressure. And maintaining pressure for at least three to four seconds changes the sensory input into the brain because there's three sensors along the spine. You've got the joint mechanoreceptors and the facet joints. You've got the muscle spindles and the intrinsic muscles. Even the ligaments have sensory components. So all of these, by maintaining pressure just for a few fractions of a second <laughs> to, to one to two seconds, you'll feel the intrinsic muscles change in tone, and then you're going to be able to get a very, very significant traction. Now, this is, again, done exactly according to X-rays. And some of the um, contraindications are going to be fusions, surgical fusions. There's going to be a lot of different things. That's why this can only be done by an experienced chiropractor. If there is a loss of curve for head carriage, getting that cur cervical curve back. Now, on the left, um, she's using a theracurve, something that I invented where you just pull down with about two pounds of pressure and point your chin up to the ceiling. Very, very simple. Real dynamic because the discs get their nutrients through movement, so you're inducing motion. Motion in the center picture here. This is what I give for office workers or kids that have had some type of neck trauma. I'll tell them to lay on their tummy, put their chin in their palms, so their head is relaxed, and then deep breathe. That deep breathing increases the intrathecal pressure, which is fantastic. And the third one on the right is the posture pump. Now I worked with Dr. Graham for nine years, the guy who invented this. And I love the elliptoid decompression. It's absolutely fantastic. Except I would not recommend the posture pump unless you assess your spine um, for mobility. That's why we do static and extension x-rays to make sure that it can be moved. Now, on the sternoclavicular adjustment, you have to assess it correctly. And we've done that on our sternoclavicular um, assessment and correction video. You're going to assess whether it's um, gone medial gone inferior, gone superior, and you have to stabilize the neck so you're isolating that adjustment. For the acromion clavicular joint, the same thing. You want to not be blasting into that spine. You want to just isolate that. And that's why the adjustments, they're under very, very little pressure. I'm talking the majority of them are two to four pounds of pressure. And even assessing and correcting that glenel humoral joint, okay, and there's a lot of ways to gap that joint and to set it back in place, depending on if it's an inferior, an anterior, which is the most common, and then to restore that labrum. Now, and this, your palms are forward, you're going butt to belly, just swinging 
and um, kind of like a grandfather clock, and that's going to start to restore that glenohumeral joint or any distorted labrum. So, and we've done detailed videos on all of that, so I encourage you to look at that. But now let's assess it. Okay, so one of the things, the elbow is resting on the doctor's knee, and he's going to apply about maybe two pounds of pressure. You're not forcing it in there. You're just testing it. And with the elbow bent 90, you know, what this is doing, it's giving you a baseline. Just have the patient resist and hold it there. You're not testing strength of your strength versus the patient's strength. You're just applying a pressure to see the strength that he can resist. And again, it's usually around two to three pounds of pressure, five pounds if the arm is really, really big and muscular. Now, this gives you a baseline because you're testing the triceps. Then you need to stimulate the flexor epicondyle, and that's checking the ulnar. So the hand is going to be in a flex position, and then you apply the exact same amount of force. What you'll see, because you've got the mechanoreceptors in that joint, and if that ulnar is deviated, even though you're still testing triceps, and this is the coolest thing, you're testing the strength here, you instantly check, and you'll see there's a shaking or a weakness. Now, you're still testing the triceps, but if that ulnar is off, the mechanoreceptors in that joint, if it's misaligned, will weaken the muscle. That's the beauty of this. And then also, I recommend once you correct that ulnar to retest. I mean, why not always retest to make sure that you've done it? Now, when you're looking at this, you've got the radius that rotates and you've got the ulnar that's a hinge. And that ulnar is close to the medial condyle. So this means all of the flexors, and this is why the ulnar, we're talking over 90%, subluxates medially, not laterally. And that means it's going towards the midline. Now, the ulnar, it can subluxate laterally or medially. I've seen it laterally on a lot of people that do um, arm wrestling matches or certain um, jobs that, that will cause a lot of force loading on that elbow. Now, so when you're looking at this, most chiropractors really don't get a lot of training in extremity adjusting. So you, the number one thing is to not hyperextend that arm. There is not a lot of structures to stop that hyperextension and you can damage severely. So you do not want to hyperextend that arm. You do want to distract the arm, and this is the key. So when you're looking at this distraction, you supinate for the ulnar, and this means it's supinated. You contact to distract that joint out proximal to the wrist. You don't want to grab the wrist bones because those carpal bones um, it, it can be exquisitely tender if there is a problem with any of the upper extremity of the cervical spine. So proximal to the wrist. You have to distract to open up that wrist, and you're not going to hyperextend. You can see his elbow has a slight flex in it. Now, I put my thumb on top to make sure that I'm not going to hyperextend that. And the line of drive is literally hooking that medial aspect of the ulnar and driving it right down to the floor. But again, you do not want to hyperextend the elbow. And this has, can only be done by an experienced chiropractor or an experienced doctor who understands extremity adjusting. And then after you do this adjustment, I, I absolutely recommend you retest that, that triceps. Now, to check for the radius, okay? So the medial uh, epicondyle is where the flexors are, and that's where the ulnar is. The lateral epicondyle is where the extensors are. And the same thing, you do the, the neutral position to check the strength of the triceps, if it is weak when the wrist is in extension or there is a slight shake to it, then you've got to understand that those mechanoreceptors at that radius are going to be altered. Now, to check if it's gone um, literally anteriorly or posteriorly, this is where you've got to have the patient with their, their arms on their tummy and you're going to check. So you've already checked to see if the strength of the affected arm is weakened, okay? And the other side is going to be strong. So you're going to check or palpate both radial heads. And if you can feel that radial head is more posterior or more anterior, 
and the muscle test is showing that there is a weakness, then you've identified it. So literally check both sides at the same time. And it will be very, very clear that that radial head has gone posterior or anterior. Now, when you adjust this, and again, you do not want to hyperextend. And this is a setup for an anterior subluxation. And um, actually, no, this one's for a posterior subluxation. That's the elbow. So it's set up for a posterior subluxated radius. But what you have to do, you're going to supinate for the ulnar corrections. You're going to pronate for the radius. And I would, when I was teaching this, I'd say pronate for the radius so they would understand. And now this is set up for a posterior. Again, you're contacting to distract that joint proximal to the carpals, not at the carpal. So up, up the arm and you have to pull this out. So you're going to be distracting that whole joint. And then it's only about one to two pounds of pressure. It's very, very simple because you're opening up that joint with a distractive force. And then you can do the anterior, and this is very, very simple. Just hook it with your middle finger, pull it down, and slightly flex, and it's almost a scissors move, but it sets so nice and so easy. And again, you're using max one to two pounds of pressure. But then always, always, always retest to make sure that you've done it. Now, once the radius and ulnar are aligned and functioning properly, you've got to get the muscle balance of the forearms because flexors, um, an extensor should be a five to four strength ratio. And this is why one of the greatest exercises in the world, and this is also going to be for a lot of wrist issues, but to restore the muscle imbalance of the forearm is a uh, flower bud to claw. And this is a number 32 rubber band. And I say that because, well, you know, I, 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 I work three months out of the year in, in Bangkok and they don't have good rubber bands over there. Their rubber bands are real rubber. Okay, so number 32 rubber band, and it, hair ties will work also, but flower bud to claw, flower bud to claw. And you're going to do this exercise to fatigue. And I tell patients, you know, because think of this, everything you're doing throughout the day, you're grabbing, you're flexing, you're grabbing that suitcase or briefcase or typing. You're going to be doing all of these flexor activities. So you're correcting the muscle imbalance because you're not designed to only use one part of your arm. So. Um, once you get a qualified, um, a corrective doctor, someone that understands anatomy physiology that has experience or they're learning under an experienced doctor. Okay. So this is why when we put the five keys to health, we're talking proper nerve supply. When you're looking at elbow issues, you have got to look at the nerves that come out of the neck. That, that's the nerve supply and blood supply. If there's a forward head carriage, it's not going to work. And imagine if you're given an exercise or correcting that forearm without correcting the neck, it's like having a tourniquet on it. So proper nerve supply, number one, sufficient, regular exercise. This means if you're looking at the old ulnar or the elbow, flower bud to claw to work those extensors and then proper nutrition. The diet isn't that hard. Just make sure it's like your great, great grandparents organic, seasonal, varied. Um, if there's any preserved food, it's going to be fermented. So you get healthy bacteria in that system. And then rest is when the body regenerates. It's hugely important. And then prayer and meditation. Every study out there that shows you when you add prayer, okay, healing occurs more rapidly. It works 100% of the time. Now, it, make sure you post your questions. And we're going to get to as many of them as we can. We have to divide the questions up into two different sections. One where I, I think it'll get by, and the other one will be on our free site, the Dr. BVIP site. God bless you all. Stay healthy, my friends.